The Crypto Terrestrial Hypothesis sounds like the main plot point from a 90s or even 80s horror movie, where the story revolves around bloodthirsty creatures inhabiting some cave system in the rural heartland of the USA, only to come out when it's feeding time. And yes, I have seen the movies The, De the Descent and The Hills Have Eyes, but no, these are not the type of crypto terrestrials I am referring to in today's episode. What does the crypto terrestrial hypothesis mean? Who came up with such a cool sounding name to the theory? And more importantly, why is this theory key to potentially explaining the true nature of the others? Given that the nuts and bolts extraterrestrial hypothesis appears to be one of many origins for the beings that are visiting and traversing our skies and realities. Let's start with the origin of the term. The exact term itself was not explicitly uttered, but had its origin in a book titled Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures, a study of subterranean mysteries in history, folklore, and myth. It was published for the first time in 2007 and was written by mythologist William Michael Mott. Mott says the following in his book in relation to what he calls an indigenous race of humanoid aliens. As the recent find of Homo floresensis, the cave-dwelling, cannibalistic hobbit of the Indonesian island of Flores, demonstrates, beyond any doubt, hidden humanoids with both subterranean habitats and nasty habits may belong more to the realm of a stealthy and hidden reality beside our own than to just the areas of folklore and mythology. Folklore and fact overlap and are one in this instance. Perhaps this indicates that humanity has never, ever, truly been alone. Further on in the book, Mott reiterates the following. Upon inspection, it is found that not only is the subterranean humanoids in hiding a universal theme, common in nearly or possibly every folk tradition, but it is echoed in the various mythological cycles and in the great religions of the world, stretching back into the most distant antiquity. So what is Mott saying exactly regarding the notion of indigenous humanoids living side by side with us, Homo sapiens, here on Earth? Basically, what Mott is saying is that there is strong evidence in religion, in folklore and mythology that we, humanity, have always shared our planet with one or more hidden civilizations of an advanced nature which are generally indifferent to humanity. Now that sounds outlandish, doesn't it? I mean, what are the chances that such a race living side by side with us could remain hidden from humanity's prying technological eyes over a multitude of time? Enter into the picture former Starbucks barista, yes you heard that right, named Mac Tonys. Tonys Wikipedia bio reads as follows. Mac Tonys was an American author and blogger whose work focused on futurology, transhumanism, and paranormal topics. Tonys grew up in Independence, Missouri and attended William Chrisman High School and Ottawa University. He lived in Kansas City, Missouri. Tonys had an active online presence and a small but devoted readership, but supported himself by working at Starbucks and other 9-to-5 jobs. In 2009, he died of cardiac arrhythmia at the age of 34. That's right. Sadly, Tonys passed away of a hidden heart condition at the young age of 34. I first heard of the name Mac Tonys while listening to multiple episodes of the Paracast podcast many years ago when he was a guest on the show. I remembered his mentioning of the term crypto-terrestrials during his appearances on the, on the podcast, but did not think too much of it given its fantastical claims. I mean, how could something that seemed to be straight out of the Shaver Mystery stories be considered possible? Fast forward more than 15 years, and after listening to individuals in the alleged UFO circles, Individuals such as Lou Elizondo, Tom DeLonge, and Jim Semivan, 
I started to realize that maybe Mac Tonys was truly onto something with his inception of the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis. Prior to his untimely death, Tonys had appeared on multiple podcasts in addition to the Paracast, where he described some research that he was doing in his self-proclaimed role as a theoretical ufologist, which is a great term, on a concept he called the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis. Tonys himself, a voracious reader of all things paranormal, ufological, and mythological, pondered this idea of an indigenous humanoid race of aliens living among us after reading Mott's book. Tonys began to postulate how this idea of a hidden earthbound race could be proven to be reality. Tonys was the author of a well-known Kansas City area internet blog called Post Human Blues. It was in a random blog post response that a reader of his first used the term crypto-terrestrial to describe a concept that Tonys was trying to flesh out. And why did Tonys think that the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis could be a way to explain the origin of the others? Tonys would state that the extraterrestrial hypothesis, or ETH, had so far come up empty in terms of verifiable proof. Furthermore, the fact that we, humanity, had not fully explored yet our deepest oceans and caves on Earth made him start to lean in the direction where the ETH was not the predominant origin story for the others. Even further, the phenomena itself, Tonys pondered, had many elements of deception and the need to remain hidden from what it seemed like. He perceived that these alleged crypto-terrestrials might be actually appearing to us as gray aliens in an attempt to deceive us in order to remain hidden from human eyes. But why was this the case, surmised Tonys? In his last few years, Tonys would state in multiple interviews that he was working on a book on the theory of the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis. Unfortunately, this book would remain unpublished at the time of his death. However, some of his close friends in the ufological community, including noted author Nick Redfern and investigator Greg Bishop, would come to his estate's aid and would help to posthumously publish what is now Tony's most well-known work, aptly titled, The Crypto-Terrestrials, A Meditation on Indigenous Humanoids and the Aliens Among Us. As a self-proclaimed theoretical ufologist, what did Tony's indicate in his book were the main reasons he felt that the origin of the others, of these crypto-terrestrials, was one closer to home than further out amongst the stars. First of all, Tony started with the Occam razor-like premise that if we were being visited by extraterrestrial beings, that these beings are probably from some extrasolar planet in either our own or some other galaxy. However, Tony's deduced that if this was the case, why would a presumably intelligent species of advanced life travel upwards of four light years, the distance from Earth to a first potential Earth-like planet orbiting Proxima Centauri, and instead of making clear contact with us, humans, would go on to crash land on Earth multiple times over multiple events. I mean, if you think about it, it really doesn't make sense, does it? It's like traveling from Los Angeles to Australia for vacation, only to end up sitting in your hotel room for the duration of the time instead of visiting locations like the Sydney Opera House and the Great Barrier Reef. I hope that analogy makes sense. Therefore, Tony's concluded that based on his initial assumption, extraterrestrials from some other extrasolar planet were probably not a great origin story for the phenomena of the others on Earth. Tony's further deduced that if extraterrestrials were to truly have some origin on an extrasolar planet, then they themselves would not necessarily come visit us, but instead would send something more efficient to scout humanity first, possibly drones, or even something like Tony's described as nanodust. In other words, these alleged extraterrestrials would not want to show their quote-unquote faces to us, and would instead remain in the shadows. That sounds pretty scary. And so, Tony surmised, the extraterrestrials of lore might be something more than interstellar in nature. 
Tony's then began to think about an alternative origin. What if these extraterrestrials were interdimensional, existing in some plane of reality contiguous with our own, but yet not always reachable due to their dimensional location? This would in turn explain how UAP could blink in and out of our perceived existence, since technically they shared some localities of our physical surroundings. But Tony's believed there was more to this notion. Tony's again surmised, what if the traditional ET phenomena was simply a cover story, a facade for the true nature of the others? Tony's ultimately believed that the others' true intent was to distract us into believing the extraterrestrial and or interdimensional reality of their existence in order to remove the focus from their truer nature, that of the crypto-terrestrial flavor. And what does that exactly mean? To quote the famed John Keel, Both UFO displays and quote-unquote monster sightings are psychic distractions enforced and pressed upon us by an unseen intelligence. And now, to quote Tony's, The UFO intelligence as we see it somehow hinges on our belief in it. But what about these crypto-terrestrials did Tony's think makes them different from your typical gray alien, or tall white, or even the alleged insect-like entities that some experiencers of the phenomena have I witnessed? The short answer, it's complicated. In his book, Tony's went into great detail on the Antonio Villas Boas alien abduction case. This case took place in 1957 in Brazil and involved a farmer, Villas Boas, who was allegedly abducted by aliens and forced to have sex with a humanoid looking female alien. The following is a snippet of the account as taken from Wikipedia. Shortly after this, Boas claimed that he was joined in the room by another humanoid. This one, however, was female, very attractive, and naked. She was the same height as the other beings he had encountered, with a small pointed chin and large blue cat-like eyes. The hair on her head was long and white, somewhat like platinum blonde, but her underarm and pubic hair were bright red. Boa said he was strongly attracted to this woman, and the two had sexual intercourse. During this act, Boas noted that the female did not kiss him, but instead nipped him on the chin. When it was all over, the female smiled at Boas, rubbing her belly and gestured upwards. Boas took this to mean that she was going to raise their child in space. The female seemed relieved that their task was over, and Boas himself said that he felt angered by the situation because he felt as though he had been little more than a good stallion for the humanoids. Why was Tony's very interested in this case? Here is the answer. Tony's believed that given the compatibility in terms of the act of intercourse between V.S. Boas and this alleged female alien, that this meant that V.S. Boas and this alien were probably not very different in terms of anatomical structure, unlike a human and an insect per se. Tony's could not work towards a conclusion of how a true extraterrestrial being would somehow have a congruous anatomy to that of a homo sapien that would allow for the act of intercourse to, to naturally take place between the two species. That's if this extraterrestrial being was truly from another star system or even an extrasolar planet. But what if this being was originally from somewhere closer to home, so to speak? If the anatomies of V.S. Boas and this being were adaptable, then maybe that meant they both originated from a somewhat common place called Earth. And that is a key conclusion that Tony's conjectured, that the alien being from the Antonio V.S. Boas alien abduction case from 1957 was actually not an extraterrestrial in the common sense, but was really a crypto-terrestrial. In other words, the being was a member of an indigenous population of non-human but humanoid-shaped beings sharing the planet with us. 
But why the need for abduction or even intercourse? Tony's gathered that this might be the case due to a potential genetic syndrome or fallacy affecting this crypto-terrestrial society. And therefore, their only possibility for survival would be to mate, so to speak, with the other indigenous intelligent species of Earth, Homo sapiens, in hopes of stopping their own genetic degradation. As far-fetched as this sounds, there are many abduction cases where abductees are somehow informed that this is the true intent of the abduction phenomena, that there is a genetic aspect to intercourse-like actions and or activities that abductees have often reported during an abduction event. To quote noted UFO researcher Albert Budden, Abductions are the psyche's way of maintaining identity when faced with acute allergic distress. If these cryptoterrestrial beings are involved in the abduction phenomena, logically speaking, where do they live on Earth that they remain so inconspicuous and elusive? I mean, even during abduction experiences, abductees report a variety of settings for the abduction experience itself, but not necessarily a cave or even some abandoned shaft on Earth. Well, Tony's provides a clear answer to that. Maybe they are hiding in plain sight. In his book, he describes a story that a user posted on his online blog. It briefly goes something like this. The author was at a convenience store somewhere near a rural outskirt of St. Louis, Missouri, sometime in 1974. The author said that as he was perusing the shelves for some items to buy, in walks an individual who he immediately looked at because of the odd bodily figure that the individual and the aura they gave off. He could tell that the individual was a female, in a sort of way, but that something about her was off. What did this alleged female come in to buy? Answer, some cigarettes. But the author of the story continued to feel that something was just not right about this quote-unquote woman. He felt that she was appearing to him as a woman, but that she really wasn't one. He would later describe this being as follows. With long fingers, a pointed chin, a large head, pale or ashen complexion, and large Asian-like eyes. In other words, similar but not quite like your typical gray alien. Could this individual have been a hybrid of some sort, or a crypto-terrestrial walking amongst us? Who knows? Tony's does, interestingly, go on to say that witnesses of alleged extraterrestrial beings oftentimes smell a faint cigarette smoke odor that lingers in the air when encountering these supposed aliens. If these alleged crypto-terrestrials do indeed walk amongst us, then that would explain how it is that we cannot literally find their hiding place, since technically they might be next to us on a train, a plane, or walking behind us on a sidewalk. On the other hand, another explanation that Tony's provides for the location of the supposed home of these CTs has to do with the concept originally developed by noted Fortean John Keel. The concept is called the superspectrum. To quote John Keel, The ultra-terrestrial being occupies the higher realms of an unseen superspectrum. What does this mean? Like Keel, Tony's also was of the opinion that crypto-terrestrial beings might not necessarily be palpable and physical, but something else. This is where the superspectrum comes into play, where according to Keel, UFOs and their controlling passengers were actually composed of a material or energy that originated only within certain frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. These frequencies were in the upper range of the spectrum. This range of frequencies is what Keel referred to as a super spectrum. So Tony speculated that these crypto-terrestrial beings would physically manifest themselves during short excursions into a range of the electromagnetic spectrum that would have been visible to us humans. And we know that visible light lives within the 380 to 700 nanometer spectrum. Therefore, crypto-terrestrials might for the most part abide permanently 
within a spectrum range not visible to the human eye. In other words, a crypto terrestrial could be standing next to you and next to me right now, and we wouldn't even know it. It seems that in the case of the superspectrum explanation, this could be summarized with the following quotes from the noted author of American Cosmic, Dr. Diana Pasulka. Humans are being used by this non-human intelligence as a conduit or portal for the phenomenon's manifestation. Here are some concluding remarks on the concept of the crypto-terrestrials. Mac Tony's was not an on-field UFO researcher. As mentioned earlier, he considered himself to be a true theoretical ufologist, and he truly was one of the utmost quality. The idea he developed regarding the crypto-terrestrials is simply that, an idea about the origin of the others. But Tony's himself stated that the concept of the crypto-terrestrials could be one of many accurate explanations for non-human intelligences that are without a doubt paying us a visit. Other accurate explanations could be the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the interdimensional hypothesis, and even the notion of a great deception, i.e., extraterrestrials might have an angelic or demonic origin in the religious sense. To end today's episode, I leave you with a whimsical quote from Jacques Vallée's seminal work, Passport to Magonia. It is pertinent now, today, more than ever, in the UFO research world, given that the crypto-terrestrial hypothesis, in addition to so many other high-strangeness hypotheses, might be closer to reality than further from it. As Jerome Cardin says, Be this fact or fable, so it stands. I cannot offer the key to this mystery. I can only repeat. The search may be futile. The solution may lie forever beyond our grasp. The apparent logic of our most elementary deductions may evaporate. Perhaps what we search for is no more than a dream that, becoming part of our lives, never existed in reality. We cannot be sure that we study something real, because we do not know what reality is. We can only be sure that our study will help us understand more, far more, about ourselves. This is not a worthless task, and this idea gives me comfort. Thank you for listening, and, as always, question everything.